What is a bushcraft knife and what makes a good bushcraft knife? We're going to talk about that. A bushcraft knife is essentially a blade that's optimized for many functions in the wilderness. Now the criteria that makes a good bushcraft knife can vary from person to person. You'll get different answers depending on who you ask. The generally agreed upon consensus though is that a bushcraft knife should chiefly be very good at carving with because so much of bushcraft has an emphasis on being able to manipulate your environment and carve wood. Wood carving is a broad category though and uh, a good bushcraft knife should be able to do everything from cutting down saplings and uh, splitting bow staves to intricate carving and even engraving, drilling holes in wood if need be. It's got to be an all-around jack-of-all-trades when it comes to woodwork. It should definitely be a fixed blade as well. Fixed blades just tend to be more rugged, more durable. There's just no components that can wear out, especially with tougher tasks like batoning wood. And that's not to say that folding knives aren't useful. They're incredibly useful and nice to have around. I usually have more than one knife on me, one of them being a folding knife. But a really good bushcraft knife is going to be a fixed blade knife just because it's so much more rugged. They tend to be a little bit safer too. Uh, a lot of accidents happen every year from people closing folding knives wrong and from them not being locked when in use. So as big and scary as fixed blade knives are, they're often the safer choice. Now immediately, this sets bushcraft knives apart from your typical survival knife or any sort of tactical knife that you may have had advertised to you. It rules out almost every knife that you'll find in Walmart or most big box stores. A rule of thumb I follow for bushcraft knives is at the bare bones basics of it, for overnight camps and survival outings, I want a knife that can handle all the general tasks I'll be doing with smaller wood. Then I want an axe with me, like my tomahawk here, to handle any bigger pieces of wood and break that down. Unlike a lot of people, I don't usually carry a saw. I use an axe for a lot of the tasks that other people would use a saw for, but that's my own preference. A bushcraft knife also needs to have a long enough blade that it can be useful for tasks like batoning wood and processing materials from the wild, like edible plants or stripping fiber, and in my opinion, it should be a good skinning knife too. A knife that can do all those things well and is an appropriate length, that's a good bushcraft knife in my book. There's more criteria I look for as well, but for a lot of people, it just becomes a matter of preference after, after the foundational things are covered. Now, it's pretty widely accepted that a bushcraft knife has a blade between three and a half and about five inches. If you're not familiar with knives, that's more blade than you might think. And you also don't want any of that blade serrated. I'm so sick of how many knives I see that have little inch and a half or two inch serration on the blade, and it's not even serrated right. It's serrated like a bread knife, not like a saw. It's not going to be very useful for cutting through wood. Now a very large knife with saw serrations on the spine of it, that's a different story. Some of those can be very good. But like I said before, more often than not, I'm using my ax for tasks like that. Now the reason you want the blade to be between three and a half and five inches is because anything smaller than that minimum three and a half tends to just really limit its, its usefulness for just about everything. Now a blade that short can still be very useful for skinning animals or for small amounts of carving and peeling the bark off of stuff, but it's not long enough to baton wood or to really chop into anything. A knife that short doesn't have any weight to it. You know, it doesn't have much feel in your hands. Also much easier to lose a knife that short. Now a very large knife can be incredibly useful, but it's not the same as a bushcraft knife in that it's not as versatile. Once you get past a certain length, it starts getting a little less wieldy, you know, harder to do intricate work, especially stuff like skinning an animal or finer carving on a piece. The large knives can be great for chopping and excellent for batoning. In many instances, a large knife is not a good replacement for a small ax. Having done a lot of work in the bush with a typical bushcraft knife and an ax versus a bushcraft knife and a bigger knife, I'll take the knife and the ax any day. Now, one of the most iconic bushcraft knives of the past was called the Kephart knife. An outdoorsman by the name of Horace Kephart had a blacksmith of the time make a knife of the dimensions that he wanted, and the knife sort of became an icon. Lots of big name knife companies have their own version of the Kephart knife now, and a lot of modern bushcraft knives are very similar to it. Now, in all honesty, guys, any knife you have is better than no knife at all. If it's a knife with a remotely sharp edge, it's going to be useful for something. So if nothing else, just have a knife. I don't care if it's the cheapest Gerber or Buck knife you found at Walmart. Any knife is better than no knife and will make you a far more useful person in the wilderness. 
along with giving you a way to practice skills. And that's what's most important is developing your own skill set, your own ability with a knife and ability in the outdoors. That's far more important than the type of knife you have starting out. Now with all that covered, we're going to take a look at a few knives I have here. Here I've got some great knives and some not so great knives. Now this knife here is a small buck knife. You can pick up a knife like this for pretty inexpensive at DMB Supply. I can feel the handle is hollow and it's cheap for a reason, but you know, it's, it's still a knife. It's got plenty of uses. It's plenty sharp. It would skin an animal really well. It's got a nice belly for skinning. However, the tip is so pointy because of this clipped point that I'd be worried about putting holes in a hide if I'm trying to skin an animal. It could do a good job at carving, though the straight section of the blade, which is what you do the bulk of your carving with, it's not all that long. could certainly strip bark and all that stuff, but given the steel it's made from and the cheapness of construction, it would not stay sharp long. Stainless steel can be hard to sharpen and does not stay sharp very well. Because of the size, be easy to lose, too small to baton wood with or to chop down saplings. Now here's a knife I've actually carried for a long time. Very cheap, I don't even know the brand, some Chinese company. I've carried this out of sheer convenience. The blade doesn't really lock, it's uh, mostly just a friction fit. I now carry this just to cut up bait on my trap line. It's never done a good job at staying sharp. Too small to baton wood with, cheap construction, I mean the blade the blade wiggles, and beyond it being a folding knife, there's no locking mechanism. Now, here's a pretty common knife that you can get from most big box stores. Big old Bowie style knife. Now, knives like this can be really tempting because they look big and scary. It looks like it means business. But when it comes down to it, through a little bit of use, the handle scales are popping off already. The one on the left side here is loose, and through the slightest bit of batoning, the blade is now entirely dull up from the belly to the tip. And because this knife is so big, it'd be tricky to skin animals with. I could choke up on it like this, but even then, it's a lot of material to move around. See how the belly goes concave in here? If anything, I'd want it to be straight before it hits the belly because that is far more useful for carving than a concave belly. The steel this is made from is such cheap Chinese crap that this is not something I'd recommend you get, though it is a knife and it's better than nothing. Grooves on the handle like this tend to just increase fatigue. They took efforts to try and make this more ergonomic, but with the handle ending right here, that's where your finger rests. After a bit of chopping, that's not going to feel good. There's all these bits for show, like these grooves in here. It looks like they were cut out with a, an angle grinder. They do nothing. Those are there for no reason except to make it look more mean. I've got two more knives here that are pretty good examples of an actual bushcraft knife. So we've got this knife here, a leather sheath for it. This is a knife I actually made about five or six years ago. Now I don't have any blacksmithing content on my YouTube channel yet, but I used to be really into knife making and I'm still an avid blacksmith, mostly into tool making now, especially things like axes. But this is a knife I made that I was always very proud of. This is now my wife's knife. I gave it to her a little while after we got married. But this was forged from a coil spring from a truck, part of the suspension. That steel is usually 5160. It's an alloy steel, but it's a great steel for knives. Hand forged knives from 5160 spring steel are often well worth the price because if done right, it's a great steel, makes great knives. This one's got cherry wood handles, now this is a good knife, but it's not perfect. I gave it just a little bit of a drop point and that's a really good feature to have on a bushcraft knife. Almost all the bushcraft knives I now look for are drop point knives. The original Kephart knife had a significant drop point to it. And that's just where the spine of the knife slopes down towards the tip, just gently. It's not a severe clip like on this knife. And that drop point makes it really useful for things like drilling holes, choking up on to do finer carving work. I like it better for processing animals too. It helps me not gouge into the meat when I'm skinning an animal. Now this is a good knife, but the problem with it is the handle is so small. That's why I gave it to my wife. It was a better fit in her hand than it was in mine. Originally I thought I wanted a really narrow profiled handle, and I like the thinness of the handle. That's perfect. I like a good thin handle because that allows it to be a little more ergonomic. It fatigues your hand less. 
the handle's very blocky. Like I've seen a lot of antler handled knives where it's just left really blocky. It's just terrible to use. But having a thin handle can be good, but the width from spine to belly is too little. That reduces some of its functionality because you can't quite get as solid of a grip as you would want on it. Now here's another fixed blade bushcraft knife of mine. This is actually the one from my website. I helped design this one. Now I'm not trying to get more sales here. I'm just trying to educate about what makes a good knife. This knife was designed with a lot of elements in mind. That gentle drop point, as you can see, the edge of the knife has a relatively long straight section and then a gentle belly, which is the curved part of the edge going to the tip allows it to have a really good balance between woodworking ability and skinning ability. That curved belly of a knife allows you to separate the skin from the flesh of an animal without gouging into the skin too much. When a knife is too pointy, just has too thin of a point, it really easily mars up that hide or pokes right through it. So in the design of this knife, I was trying to get a best of both worlds option. It's got a good thickness handle solid wood grips and I like that it's got just straight wood handles that's very traditional. Things were designed the way they were and used the way they were for a reason historically and I have a lot of respect for that so it's honestly irritating how many plastic and rubber handled knives there are these days to me because wood and antler handled knives those are the original ones. And they get a lot of flack these days but I think they're fantastic. The thickness of this blade is 3 30 seconds of an inch and that allows it to really excel at fine work but it's also rugged enough to stand up to things like batoning and I've chopped down three inch thick trunks of saplings using this. Side by side you can see the difference here the blades are almost the same length this one the blade is a little wider has a little more substance to it much thicker handle with that palm swell makes this one very ergonomic so I've been able to use this all day and I do use it every single day my hand never fatigues from using it. The steel that a knife is made from really matters. I'm not a fan of stainless steels because uh, there's a lot of different kinds. Many of them are hard to sharpen and the edge they keep might be better than some carbon steels, but it's not quite worth it to me. I would rather touch up a knife edge frequently that's easy to sharpen because given how frequently I am using knives, if a really hard to sharpen steel gets dull on me, I don't wanna have to spend a half hour sharpening a blade. I'd rather spend one minute on a leather strop or with a whetstone first to get a knife back up to shaving sharp. So I've never been a fan of super steels or really any stainless steel. And being a blacksmith, I just really love carbon steels. That's what's been used the longest. Traditionally, good knife steel is all about the carbon in the steel. Blacksmiths for thousands of years have known this and have tried to get higher carbon steels for better knife edges. Once you start messing around with alloys, things get really complicated. But this is good old 1084 high carbon steel. Really simple. That 84 means it has 0.84% carbon in it, roughly speaking. That carbon hardens the steel, helps it keep a harder edge. It's always a balance between how hard the knife is and how tough it is. If it's excessively hard, it will be brittle, like glass. Glass is much harder than steel, but as you know, incredibly brittle. Now, if it's too soft, it will be very tough but it's not going to hold a very good edge. The edge will frequently roll. The more carbon percentage you have in a blade, as long as it doesn't get much above 1%, the harder it's going to be, the better an edge it's going to retain, but it's going to be more brittle. So that 0.84% carbon is a really good balance to have there. This is my personal knife, and honestly, I sharpen it all the time. I've had knives that do keep a better edge, but this knife is incredibly easy to sharpen. I carry a scythe whetstone with me and I carried it long before I ever had this. And to touch up the blade takes 30 seconds, about 15 seconds on each side, and then it's back to shaving sharp. I process all of my animals with this and I'm skinning animals almost every day because I have a trap line and because I raise meat rabbits. This knife sees a lot of wear and tear on the, on the bones of those animals. Bones are notorious for immediately dulling a blade. It stands up to that abuse really well. And then it just takes a quick touch up to get it back up to shaving sharp. So usually I can skin about three or four animals before it's dull enough that I'm not cutting through the skin as quickly as I'd like. And so I touch it up then and keep on going. You'll notice some of these knives have different edge geometry. My bushcraft knife has a flat grind with a secondary bevel. That's very typical of knives, very useful. 
Many great bushcraft knives have a Scandi grind instead, which can be fantastic. Scandi grinds are really good for digging into wood. They want to carve. Now a Scandi grind is just a bevel that goes all the way to the edge, so there's no secondary bevel. As you can see, the profile of this knife is flat, then the tapered part that goes to the edge goes all the way. Now it doesn't go further up the profile of the blade because that would make the angle of the edge too thin and it would become very weak. Knives with compound bevels, as most knives nowadays have, they have that because they can have the same angle on the edge as any Scandi grind knife, but the primary bevel, which is this thicker one, it allows the part of the knife right behind the working edge to be thinner, which makes less resistance when you're carving certain materials. These days it's generally preferred, though I do love Scandi grind knives, and when I forge knives that's usually what I default to. The sheath a knife has matters as well. Uh, this sort of belt loop sheath can be nice, but it shakes around like crazy when you run with it. And it's a fabric sheath, it's not going to last long. I I've had this knife a long time. For some reason I wrapped some cotton butcher twine around it, thinking that was cool. Or I don't know. I was a teenager. I always find it annoying when a knife has a seat belt like this, because they're not easy to put on, and it just shows how cheap the sheath is, because they know that this sheath is not going to hold the knife. So instead of making an actual good friction fit, they put a belt on it. Lots of materials can make a really good sheath. There's Kydex, Kevlar, all sorts of polyesters and plastics. I'm a big fan of leather sheaths because I can make them and I can make the leather for them. So back when I would forge knives more frequently, that was my go-to. You can make a really good friction fit with leather as well because leather can be molded using a little bit of water. You can hear it click in. I was always proud of this one. Now with the Sage Smoke Survival Bushcraft Knife, this is a prototype sheath. This is the only one like this. This one is a little rough. I did a lot of practice stamping my logo on it, tried it with heat, tried a few things to get it to work. Eventually got it working really well. This was a sacrificial sheath. The sheath that now comes with the knife is much better and it has really attractive looking copper rivets that really reinforce the stitching on it so it won't come undone. Adds a lot of life to these sheaths. And because it's leather, it's customizable. I'm also a fan of lanyard holes on bushcraft knives, just so you have the option to keep the knife attached to your wrist where it's easy access. That's why the bushcraft knives I sell, they always have a lanyard hole. Well, I hope this video helped you understand a little bit more about bushcraft knives. Thanks for watching and please like and subscribe.